Okay, uh, with the first one, make me a channel of your peace. Good morning, guys. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we just pray that everything that we do this morning, all of our thoughts, all of our singing, all of our prayers, all of our listening, that all of it is to glorify you. Okay, the first song. Uh, I haven't heard for a long time. I haven't even played it for even longer, probably. Um, it's an old one, 1967. It's Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. The words I find just amazing. I, I know that I grew up with this song here in this church, and I think maybe, I'd like to think, that maybe they've um, helped guide me throughout, because they used to sing this a lot here. And uh, I you know, and just love, the, love the, the verses, love the words. Um, and uh, we can't be a channel of peace without God's amazing grace, one that we've uh, heard a lot more recently, the, the more modern version of amazing grace. <clears throat>
Um, so here's a new song. Um, it's new to all of us, <laughs> so bear with us. I just love the words, and it just makes me think that um, probably a few hours ago, I don't know if you're watching Beryl in Australia, but probably a few, a few hours ago, she um, would have gone to church in Australia. And right now, what's the time? Half ten in St. Helena. It's half ten. And so uh, my church, the Salvation Army out there, Coral Yon, they'll be, they'll be going to church. And also, my friends in Ghana at half ten right now, in a, um, Ebenezer Methodist Church in Akrapong, they'll be going to church right now. And uh, in a few hours' time, all the churches in the Bahamas and in Framingham, Massachusetts, where I used to live, all of those church, the people, they'll be going to church. And uh, this song here, it talks about people all around the world praising God. And I'm going to try my best at singing it. It's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain It's the song of the forgiven Drowning out the end Believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe and every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. So God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. So God's children singing. Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning here, good morning there. Never quite sure where there is, but good morning to everybody that's joining us this morning for the service. Um, just a very quick notice. On Saturday, the 4th of December, it is the Pease Down St. John's School Fair, and the church are going to be there. So we're representing, representing our church by being there and giving children and adults the opportunity to dress up in sort of nativity style garb and then have their photos taken so sort of you know uh, a, a 
a fun memory, but of what the real meaning of Christmas is, rather than going to visit the man in red, which would be fantastic as well. But, <laughs> but obviously, like all these things, it's going to take some um, a number of people to make sure it goes smoothly. So Julie is going to be there anyway, anyway, but would be very keen to have two people to help her. Um, two between the hours of 12 and 1, and two people between the hours of 1 and 2. So if anybody does have any availability for an hour, just to help people pick costumes and things, if she could see Julie afterwards, that would be fantastic. Ah. Okay. Okay. Did everybody hear that? I'm guessing not or no. So the 12th of December is the village carols taking place in the hall at school. Um, the harbour are Lighthouse. going to... Lighthouse. No, Lighthouse. Thank you. Lighthouse are going to be performing a nativity rap, which is well worth seeing. If you just come for, for that, it's worth it. The Midsummer Norton Town Band, Silver Band, will be there as normal, doing with their beautiful music, and also the school choir and orchestra and things will all be taking part. So, and there will be refreshments afterwards, which again, church are going to be um, putting on for, for, for the village. Is that everything, Linda? Brilliant, thank you. So that just leaves me to welcome David this morning as our minister and may God be with you as you um, share his words with us this morning. God bless. Okay.
God, this morning as we gather in this place, how good it is to know that you are a God who is eternal. You're a God who came and was born amongst us as your son, Jesus Christ. And as we worship and praise you this morning, we look forward to your returning again. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, come so that all may be made new. Each one of us restored and glorified alongside you, our Heavenly Father. May this world new again, Lord, restore it to it, the glory that it should be, perfect in every way that you made it. And so until that time, we wait upon you, God. We wait upon you so that you might be our strength, our God, our Savior. you think heaven's going to be like when you get there but I think there's going to be a lot of dancing and uh, just looking around this morning and looking at the the joy and the dancing and the streamers waving and the 
the smiles of those of you who haven't got your masks on, and the singing, and just the rejoicing in that freedom and liberty. I think it's going to be a little bit like that. Somebody once said that what we do here on a Sunday morning, what we do here on earth is just like a, a practice for heaven, a choir practice for heaven. And so we, uh, we are blessed indeed, blessed as a people of God, blessed because we are known by God, we are loved by him. And so as we continue to offer our praise to him, let's do so with the knowledge of that understanding in our hearts, in our minds. God knows us, God loves us. So let's dance and sing and be free in that. God our Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful day. We give you thanks that we're able to sing your praises. And may that song go on forevermore. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So those of you who are part of Harbour, you have a really exciting morning in store. So I hope you've come with lots of energy and ready to do some fantastic things. 
And as you go off to harbour, and we're already going, we bless you in God's name and uh, have a wonderful time. Oh, before you go, we've got something else to do first. Thank you. <laughs> we've got a video to watch. Yes. Because, uh, as you know, some of you have been collecting uh, stuff and filling shoe boxes ready to send off. So we've got a quick video to show you. Um, from the um, Samaritan's Purse about this year's shoebox appeal. Thank you. This little shoebox has the opportunity to change the world by reaching one child at a time. And not only are they going to get a shoebox, they're going to get the love and the message of Jesus Christ. This is my home. Today is Christmas Day. I sing a song. Then I get a gift. When I open, I get a book and the, the door. The box make me feel good and happy. The box make me feel loved by God. After these children open the box, they have the opportunity to go through the greatest journey, the 12 lesson discipleship program, where they get to learn more about Jesus Christ. And this is growing up a generation of children that love Jesus and that will stand on his truth. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so, oh, that's better. Okay. My batteries have run flat for a minute. Yes, uh, we've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> Let me just move this out of the way so I can see you properly. Okay. Um, as you know, um, a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, rather, um, the Methodist Conference voted to change standing orders uh, regarding same-sex marriage and allow, made that allowable in uh, um, individual churches. Um, the final decision of, of that is for each individual church and a church council that's elected body, elected from the membership of the church who are the trustees. In order to, for our church council to uh, come to the uh, decision, we had um, an open meeting here a couple of weeks ago, and then the church council met uh, subsequently, uh, very prayerfully, uh, to consider all the options open to us, because it's, uh, it's not just a simple uh, yes or no uh, option. There are other options. And recognizing that we're not under pressure to make an immediate decision, and wanting to be pastorally sensitive, uh, to the needs of indi individuals, but also to hold together the different theological views within the church, uh, we've decided to defer our decision for the time being. This will allow us to continue to pray and to try and discern uh, precisely what our church should do, to continue to listen to one another, and more importantly, most importantly, to listen to God. And as I say, to explore some of the other options that were raised during our meeting uh, last a week last Thursday. So we'll be revisiting this matter uh, in January, 
Uh, so as things stand, uh, nothing has changed. We are currently a church that is registered uh, only for heterosexual marriage, and that is how it has been, and that is how it is at the moment. So when I have anything more to tell you, uh, I will share that with you, uh, but it won't be until um, at least midway through January when we next meet. This morning, um, one of the lectionary readings is uh, from the book of Revelation. And um, the temptation uh, for, I think, many preachers is to um, move quickly on. And uh, let's see what's in the gospel reading. Let's see what one of the epistles is. Let's even go into the Old Testament before we look at the book of Revelation because it is a bit of a, a tricky one. It's not the easiest book to navigate your way through. I would encourage you to go and uh, watch my Startup for 10 this week because I spend a little bit of time uh, there about Revelation in general and why it is a book that we should uh, pay some attention to, a lot of attention to, and why we should uh, study it and understand it more. So go and have a look at that. Um, and whilst I'm talking about start of a 10, I'm not going to be doing any during Advent uh, because my main uh, viewers are doing something else during Advent. Uh, and so I'm going to take that opportunity to have a little break from doing those. So they'll be back in January. So let's hear from the book of Revelation. It's right at the beginning and uh, uh, it looks like Caroline's reading for us. Wonderful, thank you. And as you can see, it's from chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. So, church, our gospel reading is from the book of Revelation. Hooray! Do you know, this is the only book that you are promised a blessing for reading. And as mm. David said, it is largely kind of cast to one side. You don't need Mystic Meg or tarot cards <laughs> or anything. God has told you yes. what your future is, and here it is. So let's have a look. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ through John. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. One of the current popular lines of conversation within uh, church leadership circles, whether it be on Facebook groups or whether it be in seminars or um, you know, lofty institutions and all this sort of thing, one of the current topics of conversation is something along the lines of the church coming out of the pandemic must look different from the church that went into the pandemic. We can't be the same as we were before. And I can see some of what is being said. I can understand some of what's being said. But actually, um, it occurs to me that if the church is striving to be the authentic body of Christ here on earth, 
that is not something that we should be looking to change. So actually, this, whole, this idea of wholesale change because something has happened needs a bit more flesh on the bones for me. The other thing that uh, is lacking in this conversation is all the people who are saying it needs to be different aren't saying how it's going to be different or how it needs to be different. They're just saying it needs to be different. Okay, let's hear a bit more. Well, it needs to be different. <laughs> no, I didn't mean more of the same, more of detail. And, and obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit mischievous in how I'm reporting this to you, but, but that seems to be how it is at the moment. And it's, it's interesting when you, know, you put that against some of the words that we've just heard in that reading. About who God is. About how he is the one who is the beginning and end of all things. You know, we've been singing this morning about God being the everlasting God. That comes from another part of scripture. We've been singing about the blessings that we receive. We're going to sing a little bit later on about how the, the name of God is above all of the names and is so powerful. We're going to sing about the eternal nature of God's kingdom and that nothing shall stand against it. And so when we start looking at that, actually, you and I, we are, I, I won't say we're insignificant, but we're not that significant. When you put us next to the eternity, the majesty, the timeless nature, the all-powerful nature of God, you know, we, we don't match up that well, do we, in terms of how important we are. And actually, what I, don't, what I believe we need to be talking about in this terms of coming out of the pandemic is, let's refocus on these timeless, eternal realities, these truths of who God is. Let's sweep aside all the, the rubbish and see the, the prize, the jewel that is there. And maybe that's what this conversation is about, about how the church needs to be different. Let's sweep away all the, the, the detritus of being a bunch of people. And let's home in on those riches of who God is. We can't look like we did before the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic. But one truth in all of that is that God can and does look the same. He's the same Somebody finish the sentence off for me? Thank you. Today, yesterday, and forever, he's going to be the same. He always has been the same. He is the same now. He doesn't change. And so our job as the church today, as it always has been, regardless of whether we're going into a pandemic, coming out of a pandemic, whether it's before a world war or after a world war, or whatever it might be, Whatever those circumstances are, in your own personal life, your job today, as it always has been, is to give praise and honor and glory to God. And everything else follows on from that. When we were singing this morning, I said about you know, that uh, vision of, of what heaven might look like. I don't know if you, if you saw... Shall I embarrass you or your mother, Katie? Uh, all right, I'll, I'll embarrass. I don't know if you saw Ali dancing with, with um, Evie down here. It was just wonderful. Evie's dancing was great. And um, it was just so joyous. It was so free. It was so uninhibited. It was so a picture of the kingdom of God. And that is what our job is in worship find that, to recapture it, to celebrate who God is, because then 
we go from this place changed. We go from here differently to how we came in. I wasn't necessarily going to say any of that, but it just seemed relevant to where we were and what we were doing this morning. And I think we need to recapture the essence of praise, deep, deep praise of God. It's about getting back to basics, I suppose, isn't it? Maybe that's what this, this conversation about, we need to look different. It's about getting back to basics looking at Scripture, listening to God. Listening more to God than listening, listening to each other. We have to listen to each other. I'm not saying ignore each other. But actually, you know, if we start listening to each other, we start listening to uh, this person saying that, that person saying this, it's very easy to go off at a tangent. And God is saying, this is the narrow path. Listen to my voice. Listen to me first and foremost. You see, in this reading from Revelation, I think we see a picture here of what the church needs to look like, regardless of where we are in history. This is how it always has been and always will be. We need to be a people freed from sins by the blood of Jesus. And secondly, we need to be a kingdom of priests serving God. That is what this reading says to us. This is how God pictures us as his church. A people freed from sins by the blood of Jesus, a kingdom of priests serving God. So we need to look at what that looks like. What is the reality of that? What does that mean for you today, what does that mean for me today? What does that mean for us here as a church? What does that mean for Peace Down or wherever we might be? What does that mean for us, the reality of that? A people freed from the sins by the blood of Jesus, a kingdom of priests serving God. It used to be quite a common phrase in Christian circles, certainly in, in more sort of like charismatic circles and evangelical circles, to be talked about being washed in the blood of Jesus. Do you remember that? Can you remember the last time you heard that said? It's not, not that often, is it? To be washed in the blood of Jesus. I suppose it doesn't come over very well in this day and age, maybe. But what about freed from sins by the blood of Jesus? That starts to give us a better understanding, maybe, about what that really means to be freed from sins by the blood of Jesus. You see, the kingdom of God was Jesus' main point of teaching when he was here on earth. He was always saying, the kingdom of God is like, and then he'd give us an example. He would also heal people, restore them into life, and tell them something along the lines of, your sins are forgiven, you have been made whole. He would show them that the kingdom of God had touched their lives. And here we find in Revelation that it's those who are in Christ who make up this kingdom. You see, this kingdom of God isn't a geographical place. It doesn't have you know, a boundary like we might think of the United Kingdom. It is made up of those who are drawn into the kingdom. It's made up of you. It's made up of me. God calls us to be his people a holy priesthood, a kingdom, serving God. And it, it consists of those who've been released from the power of sin by the blood of Jesus. And so notice the order there. You come into the kingdom by being redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and then you serve. It's not the other way around, and it's important to get that in the right order. You don't become a servant for God and then get saved. You become redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus, your sins are forgiven, 
And then you're called to this priestly service within the kingdom. And that order is important. That order is so important. You can't do it the other way around. You see, it's as a result of what Christ has done for us that we become what he intended us to be. And so if you want to be a person who loves others, you need to be released from the sin of not loving others. Do you see how that works? And you might be thinking, well, you know, I love everybody. I think, probably, mostly. I try, at least. And you see, that's the problem, isn't it? It is not humanly possible for you or I to love everybody. But God does. And so as long as we are in Christ and he is in with, within us, then it is possible for us to love even those people whom, humanly speaking, we cannot love. And so if you want to be that priestly kingdom, if you want to be that person who displays the love of God to everybody, you need to be set free from the sin of not loving by the blood of Jesus. That's how it works. And that's just one example. I'm sure we could spend a lot of time thinking of all sorts of other examples, but we won't for the moment because I think you've probably got the point. We need to be saved first, to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus in order to be able to serve him. So what does it mean to be freed by the blood of Jesus? What does that freedom look like? Well, the people of Israel, as you know, probably were enslaved in Egypt. They weren't free, they were slaves. And when God uh, made it possible for them to escape, to be freed from that slavery, he called them to sacrifice um, the, you know, an animal and to put the, the blood on the doorpost so that he knew who his people were. And they would escape the death that was coming and then be set free from slavery. And that is a very um, graphic illustration of how God sets people free. But it was only for one select group of people. The freedom that Christ brings upon the cross at Calvary is for all people. And that is why it is important that that imagery of the blood. When we take communion, we're receiving the blood of Christ poured out for us for the forgiveness of sins. And so we are we're taking that sacrament, that, that symbolic action that works inwardly for the forgiveness of our sins, and we're saying, set me free, O God. Set me free. Set me free from the sin of, and you can fill in the blank yourself there, whatever it might be. And that sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross is eternal. You see, once, once you're his, once you're marked with the blood of the cross, uh, of Jesus from the cross, you yeah. belong to him. Yeah. See, it's about giving life, the life that God intended for us. I want you to think about yourself or somebody that you know now who struggles in life. It might be they struggle with depression. It might be that they struggle with anxiety. It might be that they struggle with self-image. might be that they struggle with substance abuse. Maybe they struggle because they are abused. And maybe they're, they're, 
the scars of, of life are still upon them, whatever it is. And I've just listed a few things there, but you can all think of something. And maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody else you're thinking of. And until you or that person is set free from that thing, you don't have that life in all its fullness that Jesus intends for you. And so he says to you, my blood is for you to set you free. It's about cleansing, but it's also about release from slavery as well. And so let's just declare the blood of Jesus over the person that you're thinking of, whether it's you or somebody else, it doesn't matter. Lord God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to set us free, but not just us, our friends, our families, the person we're thinking about right now. And we know that the power of whatever that thing is has been broken upon the cross. And by the blood of Jesus, we are made clean. So bring us into that wholeness of life, we pray, O oh Lord. Break the power of that thing that we've named before you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So on the cross, Jesus bled and died for us. And his blood is a seal of the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that is able to set us free from sin, from fear, from shame, from addiction, or any other innumerable things that enslave us, keep us enslaved. So this sacrifice of Jesus is for you. In fact, we, I know this is sort of like not very British sort of way of thing of doing stuff, but I'd like, really like you to say that with me, okay? The sacrifice of Jesus is for me. Shall we do that together? Say it loud as well. Ready? The sacrifice of Jesus is for me. Amen. And don't forget that. Don't forget that. Say it regularly. Say it loudly. Say it in the deep dark of night. Say it in the midst of the tears. Say it in the, in the pain. Say it regularly. And say it over others. The sacrifice of Jesus is for you. And all our part in this amazing story is this, to accept it. You see, and that's the other thing about saying the sacrifice of Jesus for me is to accept it. Jesus died for you. And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about you and 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 me. He died for just for you. So accept it. Don't push it away. Don't, don't say you're not worthy of it. Don't say you're not worth it. Because you are. Accept this redeeming this love, this amazing grace. And then live daily as somebody who's been set free from the power of sin and death. Live it. Sing and dance it down the street. Let others see you're alive. And then, as a priestly people, our role is to point people towards God. And also to point God towards people. It works both ways. And so the second bit is sort of like the easy bit really, pointing God towards people. Or I'm thinking about my friend who needs 
you know, whatever, and so I pray for them. That's pointing God towards people in one respect. But what about pointing people towards God? Where do you do that? Where do you do that? So think about how you do it. And you can point people towards God because you've been there yourself, can't you? If you want to know the directions to somewhere, ask somebody who knows how to get there. Don't ask somebody who hasn't a clue where it is. You know how to get to the cross. You know how to come before God. You know how to kneel in humble adoration. You know how to dance in his presence. You know what it means to be healed. You know what it means to be restored. You know what it means to be alive. You know what it means. Use that to point the way. And so we do that through our ministry, through our witness, and we do it in our worship as well. I sometimes say to congregations, when we're singing, you know, the most joyful of songs, and you look up and uh, we're singing, you know, to God be the glory, great things he has done, And they're singing, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. You know, you should be singing it at the top of your lungs, shouldn't you? And and grinning like an idiot. Because it is so wonderful. So when we are worshipping together, by the way, I don't expect us to all be grinning like idiots all the time. But I do expect us to come with hearts full of gladness. I do expect us to come and bow before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I do expect us to be earnest in our praise and our worship of him. I expect that of myself and uh, you ought to expect it of yourselves as well. Because that way we know that we are alive in him. Let's pray together. How good are you, Lord. Your mercy, your grace knows no bounds. And you remove our sins from us as far as east is from the west. That's how great your love is for us. And so wash us in that blood of Christ. Purify us. Make us alive in you, we pray. So that we might be that priestly body, that kingdom of God here in this place. Until you return again, Lord Jesus. May it be so. Amen. We're going to sing again now. And um, bear in mind what I've just said, okay? Yes, get excited, Chloe. Good. Get your flag out. Get ready. Let's sing. Uh, This is about uh, the name of God. And uh, the power that is in the name of Jesus. Do you know the power of the name of Jesus? Anybody? You don't sound very sure. Do you know the power of the name of Jesus? Before that name, nothing can stand. He's all-powerful. He's almighty. He's the Lord of Lords. How are we starting this? Let's stand and sing.
God recently then? I'll bring the microphone out so you can all come and share with us. Um, Anna and I were um, doing communion on the street yesterday morning. It was brilliant, wasn't it? Um, we had a table set up in the entrance to the car park with the communion cloth on and the bread and the wine. And it had stopped raining, or stopped drizzling, and, uh, um, and there were lots of people walking past. We had some fantastic conversations, and um, we really saw God in, uh, in lots of those conversations there. Um, and there's just one, one lady in particular, um, she came past, and uh, she was going for her jab up at the chemist, and um, she stopped to talk. And she needs God in her life today. Uh, she's struggling with um, her own health, but her husband is struggling even more with, with all sorts of things in his life. And uh, she just um, was a person who was there ready to receive. And uh, so we, we uh, hopefully we blessed her and uh, as we prayed with her and uh, uh, gave her the body and blood of Christ. So I ask you to pray for her. I won't share her name, but uh, um, just pray for that lady. Thanks. Where have you seen God recently? Where have you noticed him? Where have you heard his voice? Don't be shy. Come on. Well done, Francis. I've often sat there and thought to myself, you know, I really ought to have something to thank God for. But I can never think of anything. <laughs> and this morning we were uh, listening to um, Christian radio. And there was a song there which starts, New every morning is the love. And the second verse goes like this. New mercies... Each returning day, surround your people as they pray. New dangers past, new sins forgiven, new thoughts of God, new hopes of heaven. And those are little things, aren't they? Perhaps things that, that we don't want to get up and say, oh yes, this wonderful thing happened. But there are small things that happen so often and all the time. And so we thank God for those. And that's why where I've seen God. Not in great big things. But in all the little things, the wonderful colours of the trees, those fantastic sunrises and sunsets that we've seen this, these last few weeks. So we thank God for those, and there is God. Mm. Thank you, Francis. Yeah. Very good. Anybody else? Come on, Alex. All right. Is that on? Um, so yeah, it's a bit of context. I don't see God anywhere, um, generally, but something happened yesterday and thinking back about it, all I hear is your words of, <laughs> where do you see God? Um, yeah. Every like, half an hour. Um, so yeah, so, so yesterday I was taking Michelle into Bath um, to the bird. Um, so I was going to go off around Bath, is it Bathgate? No, what's the one that comes down past university and then kind of down the far end of town? Bathwick. Thank you. Um, and I'm normally pretty good at managing my distractions in the car and, you know, in the car with Michelle, she's chatting <laughs> a lot. Um, so know, anyway, this has been recorded, don't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, she knows what I'm like. <laughs> she wouldn't expect any less. Um, anyway, so I ended up going down Ralph Allen, and um, I think it's Ralph Allen, yeah. And uh, just as we turned around, I said, oh, no, it's going to be a pain. But uh, there was nowhere to turn, so I carried on going. And then um, this kid pulled out of Pryor Park on a push bike. So we sort of hung back a bit from him because he was a bit all over the place. And uh, yeah, carried on going down the hill, got to about 30 mile an hour, just getting to the corner of the bottom, and he kind of went 
straight off into a wall, mm. pretty much head first. Which, um, so, so anyway, we, we kind of, obviously the first car, we were able to just stop and sort him out and get him back up to Pride Park. But then, yeah, when I was thinking about it later, it was, well, maybe that wasn't my distractions. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We're going to pray together and uh, we'll bring our prayers for ourselves, for others, uh, before God. Is there anybody, is there anybody here this morning who would like, you'd like us to pray for you? Not for somebody else, just for you. You don't have to come out. You can stay where you are. So we've got two. Um, Beryl? For somebody else. No, for you, for you, not for somebody else. No, this is special. This is my one. They're all special. Right. Yep. Oh, dear. Oh, bless him. Oh, dear. And what's her name? Uh, Janice. Janice, right. She's my sister. Thank you. And Linda, is this for you? Yes. How can we pray for you? Okay. Right, okay. So, <laughs> tell me your name again? Janice. Janice, thank you. All right. Anybody else who's here this morning would like us to pray for you? Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. Sarah. Say again, sorry. I've been working, from home. working from home, right, yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, let's pray then. Lord, we thank you that uh, you're here in this place. You hear the cries of our hearts, even when we can't form the words. Hear our cries, O God, we pray. Pray for Janice in in hospital and uh, all the many things that are are bringing her pain and discomfort and and stealing her life, O Lord, and we pray healing over her. Pray strength to her. Fill her also, Lord, with, with the knowledge of your presence. Lord, we pray for Linda. We thank you that uh, she's able to to get out and about and to to be here in worship and to see her her granddaughter and do all those things that she loves to do. But we pray against this pain, Lord, this pain of arthritis. And in Jesus' name, we bind it. We speak to those joints, Lord, and we we say be be, uh, renewed. Be reformed in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. Come upon Linda now. Bring healing, bring restoration, bring freedom of movement, freedom from pain, in Jesus' name. Sarah, Lord, we we thank you for, uh, thank you for that uh, ability to to continue to work, but we also recognize the, the increased pres- pressures of working from home and the isolation that that can bring. So we pray, Lord, that you uh, would make yourself uh, especially present with her so that working from home becomes a, a joy, becomes a pleasure. Lord, lift the, the cloud of, of loneliness, of despair on all those who find themselves at home more than they'd want to be. Put a note of, of joy in the heart, a song of celebration because you are the God 
uh, who is ever present. And Lord, we pray for all those whom we know, uh, who we want to lift up to you this morning, our friends, our families. those who don't know you yet. Lord, we pray for those whom we shall meet this week, who in meeting us might also meet you. Prepare our hearts and minds, Lord, and And if you take us down a different path than that we were expecting, may we be aware of your guiding presence. Lord, may your light shine in the darkness of this world in which we live. And as we uh, prepare to enter the season of Advent, which speaks about the coming of the Christ child. May we not simply look forward to the celebration of Christmas, but may we be messengers of hope, of peace and love, all those things that you bring, Lord, so that we might be a blessing to this world the places where we live. Lord, we hold before you those in authority in in, uh, local government, in our national government throughout the world. May they seek you, the Prince of Peace. May they look to you to govern wisely. and with justice. So Lord God, we offer to you all our prayers through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a very fitting one for uh, what we've been looking at today and what we've been thinking about. It is about the eternity of God's reign, his kingdom. So let's stand and sing together. On bended knee shall come. The kingdoms pass away, your majesty remains. How great you are, how great must be your song. The Alpha and Omega. Just stand in awe, this beggar heart responds, how great you are, how great must be your song. You're the hymn of the ages, the hope of all the world, you carried our redemption on your shoulders.
May the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>